So today is our second session on uh, the history of the church from the Reformation onward. And previously, we covered the background to the Reformation. And today, we are looking at uh, the, the man and the event that uh, is seen as starting uh, the Protestant Reformation. It's uh, Martin Luther and the 95 Theses. So today, what we will be covering we will, we will be first looking at uh, his early life and education, Martin Luther's uh, early life and uh, his life in the monastic order and his formation uh, theologically and spiritually. We will look at the incidents of the sale of indulgences and the nailing and Martin Luther's nailing of his 95 uh, theses. So we will, we will review uh, indulgences we will look at uh, Leo, Pope Leo X's uh, expansion of sale of indulgences and, and of course the, the, the event of Luther nailing the 95 Theses. Lastly, we will look at uh, some developments uh, after the 95 uh, Theses, uh, some reactions to it and a number of debates that Luther went through after that. We will only be looking at two of them, the Heidelberg Disputation and the Leipzig Disputation and we will uh, we will take our story today up to where Luther gets uh, excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. So first, uh, Luther's early life and education. Martin Luther was born in uh, Saxony, which is a region in uh, Germany in the year 1483. He is the son of uh, Hans Luther, a minor. So uh, Martin, little Martin Luther grew up very poor. His family was, uh, was poor, but uh, through hard work and industry, his father Hans managed to build up quite a lot of wealth uh, for the family and he provided for uh, Martin's education. And when Martin Luther was uh, 18 years old at the age of, uh, uh, in the year 1501, uh, he entered uh, University, uh, graduating uh, four years later near the top of his class and he was bound for a legal career, going to continue his studies to be a lawyer according to his father's uh, wishes. Now, now, young Martin Luther had, was a very, was a deeply uh, sensitive uh, soul and he grew up in the medieval uh, Roman Catholic church and he had much he had much fear for his soul a very keen uh, keen sense of sin and of uh, and of judgment and damnation hanging over him and when he was in school uh, the death of one of his school friends uh, played a very important role in uh, shaking sort of shaking him up and and making him more uh, more afraid uh, for his soul and and one day as he was traveling, he was caught in this frightful uh, lightning storm. And Luther made a vow. According to some accounts, what he said was, uh, help me, Saint Anne, I will become a monk. Now, Saint Anne was, of course, one of the saints that uh, they, uh, they prayed to. And uh, so he, he made this vow. So it was as good as making a vow uh, to him, uh, to, to God. And and when he was delivered out of uh, that lightning storm, he, he made good on his vow. And against his father's uh, strong wishes, right, yeah. to his father's great consternation, he abandoned his legal studies. And in 1505, right, just a few months after he started uh, his legal studies, he gave it up and he joined the uh, one of the monastic orders of the Roman Catholic Church, the Augustinian uh, order. Martin Luther uh, as a monk. Now, uh, I said earlier that uh, he had a very uh, sensitive soul. He, he had a much uh, a deep sense of, of sin and, and of judgment. And as a monk, he poured himself into a very rigorous ascetism, <laughs> right, into all his into all the labors of uh, of of the monastic order of self denial. He would go many days, barely eating or drinking, uh, or even sleeping. 
he suffered uh, terribly from a, from a troubled conscience. Right? Nothing he did could, uh, could bring him peace with God. Right? However much he however much he humbled himself, however much he he put himself through uh through all the through all the rigors of the ascetic life, right? None of them could could bring him a sense of peace with God by reason of uh, his sin. And while in the monastery, he came over he came under the spiritual oversight of uh, this man, Johann uh, von Staupitz. And uh, Staupitz will become a is a will be a very important uh, character in his uh, in his formation and in his uh, awakening. So Luther Luther writes this of his life as a monk. I was a good monk, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. This was Luther. Luther as a monk. And as a monk, he would... Uh, I mean, as all Roman Catholics, all good Roman Catholics, they would have to go for confession where they would uh, confess their sins to their, to their confessor. And Luther would weary out his confessors with long... Long, long litanies of all his misdeeds and all the smallest, uh, smallest sins that he had committed, from from his deed to his words to, to the most fleeting thoughts of his heart. And here we have uh, here we have an account. Luther spent so long confessing, sometimes up to six hours, that Staupitz occasionally became exasperated. God is not angry with you, Staupitz once exclaimed. You are angry with God. Do you not know that God commands you to hope? This was an accurate perception. Luther was indeed angry with the God who demanded a perfection he could never give and who condemned him for not giving it. Staupitz tried to lead the tormented young friar to a self-abandoning trust in God's free and undeserved mercy, a mercy made visible and tangible in the wounds of the suffering Jesus. Luther testified of Staupitz. He was my first father in this teaching, and he gave birth to me in Christ. If Staupitz had not helped me, I would have been swallowed up in hell and left there. You see what uh, Staupitz uh, says, and it all sounds very uh, Protestant. You see, the, the, I, the, the idea of uh, undeserved mercy, of simply trusting in the sufferings of Christ alone, was not something that was completely lost to every single person in the Roman Catholic Church. There were people who, who still understood that doctrine who trusted in Christ in, in this way and who taught others so. So that was Luther's exposure indeed to even this seed of the doctrine he would later come to teach. But we see also here his, uh, his deep sense, his deep sense of sin, right? If, uh, if he would uh, even cover the small comforts that any of his neighbor had, Right, like you see a chicken wing or that your friend has, and you, and you for a moment covered and wish, right? Yeah, that that was. That is sin already, and and Luther felt every single, uh, every single sin that he knew he committed, and he had such a rigorous self-examining mind and conscience. That he. That he never, uh, he never did let himself, uh, let himself go over any of it. So he, he was tormented, right, so greatly in his conscience. His uh, so theological formation. You just share one for them. He was ordained as a as priest in in fifteen o seven, and he became a lecturer at the University of uh, Wittenberg in. Uh, in 1508 and he studied uh, 
as a both as a monk and as a lecturer, studied the Bible and the writings of uh, Augustine. You know, the, the first books that he studied were Romans, Psalms, uh, Galatians, Hebrews, and uh, uh, the historian Robert Godfrey says uh, very tongue-in-cheekly that uh, if you want uh, four books most likely to make you a Protestant, those are the books. So he studied the Bible and he also uh, devoured the writings of, uh, of Augustine of Hippo, uh, the, the 4th to 5th century uh, church father that uh, I, I talked about in, the, in our studies in the early history of the church uh, two years ago, one of the very, uh, one of the very important uh, theologians in, in the Western church. Uh, a bit of an excursus uh, on, on the relationship between uh, Martin Luther and the doctrine of uh, justification by faith alone. So this was the first of Luther's two great theological and spiritual breakthroughs, and it occurred around 1513. He came to understand that the Apostle Paul's phrase, the righteousness of God does not mean the righteousness by which God punishes sinners, but the righteousness which he graciously gives to sinners as a free gift of salvation. At this early stage, however, Luther still understood God's gift of righteousness as the inner righteousness that the Holy Spirit produces in the heart, what fully developed Protestant theology would call regeneration and sanctification. Luther's second great breakthrough was when he came to understand faith as essentially personal trust in Christ rather than assent to the church's teachings and the righteousness of God as God's imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer's account, changing the believer's legal status before God, but not the believer's heart. Justification, in the sense in which evangelical theology uses the term. This second breakthrough did not happen till much later, probably in the period uh, 1518 to 1519. This is from Nick Needham in his book, uh, 2000 Years of Christ's Power, Volume 3. So, uh, indulgences, the incident of indulgences and uh, the 95 Theses. So, first, a uh, review of uh, indulgences, which I went through. Uh, I went through indulgences in the last month's uh, lesson. And indulgence is defined by modern Roman Catholic authorities as the remission of the temporal punishment due to God for sins already forgiven as to guilt, a remission granted by ecclesiastical authority to the faithful from the treasury of the superabundant satisfactory merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, of Mary most holy, and of the saints. Okay, so, so the form this takes is a, is a certificate, the content of which I, I will have a, uh, I have a quotation uh, for you later. So it's essentially... Um, something that you could uh you could receive in order to to get uh to get released from uh from punishment from god uh in this life from from punishment exacted by uh, the church uh, and and the, the the idea of uh the theory of indulgence grew right to to start to include um uh release from punishments in the life to come as well particularly in uh in purgatory right for yourself right or you could also purchase for the date right you could purchase the you could purchase an indulgence uh for someone else who had already died and uh is in purgatory and and yes uh it became indulgences became uh increasingly commercialized from the from the start, it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that could be bought uh, with money very easily, but over time it grew to be the case. And in the time of uh, Martin Luther in fifteen fifteen, the Pope Leo the Tenth announced a special sale of indulgences to raise funds for the construction of Saint Peter's Basilica. Okay, Saint Peter's Basilica. You go there, the Vatican uh, City. That's the Basilica. Uh, over there, and the man he commissioned for the job, Johann Tetzel, went around as a traveling salesman. He was a master um, market 
marketer, showman, salesman, what have you. He, he went around preaching indulgences. Yeah. Preaching indulgences as a sort of uh, as a sort of gospel in itself. I give you a sample. Oh, imbecile and brutish people who perceive not the grace which is so rightly offered to you. Now heaven is everywhere open. Do you refuse at this hour to enter? What? When then will you enter? Now you can ransom so many souls, hard-hearted and thoughtless men. With 12 pence, you can deliver your father out of purgatory and you are ungrateful enough not to save him. I will be justified on the day of judgment, but you, you will be punished so much the more severely for having neglected so great salvation. I declare to you that though you had only a single coat, you would be bound to take it off and sell it in order to obtain this grace. Know you why our most holy Lord is distributing so great a grace? His object is to raise up the ruined church of St. Peter and St. Paul so that it may not have its equal in the universe. That church contains the bodies of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and of a multitude of martyrs. Owing to the actual state of the building, these holy bodies are now, alas, beaten, flooded, soiled, dishonored, and reduced to rottenness by the rain and the hail. Ah, are these sacred ashes to remain longer in mud? And disgrace, yes, buy more indulgences so that we can build the beautiful church over uh, their bodies. Uh, and uh, there was this very famous uh, jingle that uh, Tetzo, Tetzo wrote. So it was, a, it was in German where, uh, where he was selling it when Martin Luther uh, uh, found him. And it rhymed in German, but you can translate it to rhyme in English too. As soon as the coin in the copper rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Very clever. <laughs> right. Now, uh, I said I'll give you a, what is the content of this indulgence. So here it is. Okay. This is uh, the, the certificate that they will purchase. May our Lord Jesus Christ have pity on thee and your name and absolve thee by the merit of his most holy passion. And I, in virtue of the apostolic power entrusted to me, absolve thee from all ecclesiastical censures, judgments, and penalties, which thou mayest have deserved. Moreover, from all the excesses, sins, and crimes which thou mayest have committed, how great and enormous soever they may have been. And for whatever cause, even should they have been reserved to our yeah. most holy yeah. father, the Pope, and to the apostolic see. I efface all the marks of disability and all the notes of infamy which thou mayest have incurred on this occasion. I remit the pains which thou shouldst have to suffer in purgatory. I render thee anew a partaker in the sacraments of the church. I again incorporate thee into the communion of saints and re-establish thee in the innocence and purity in which thou wert at the hour of thy baptism, so that at the moment of thy death, the gate of entrance to the place of pains and torments will be shut to thee, and on the contrary, the gate which leads to the heavenly paradise will be open to thee. If thou art not to die soon, this grace will remain unimpaired till thy last hour arrive. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friar John Tetzel, commissary, has signed it with his own hand. Now, here, a certificate of... Uh, of complete uh, indulgence covering you uh, from now to eternity from all kinds of sins that you may commit. This was, uh, this was the indulgences that uh, Tetzel was uh, peddling to uh, the common people. And, and of course, people did see there were there were people who did see through uh yeah, see through so this so nonsense so and this <laughs> and this abuse and there have been also some amusing uh amusing stories to come out of that. Uh there was a there was this wife of a shoemaker who bought uh who bought an indulgence. Uh she died soon after, and the shoemaker didn't have a mask uh, set for her. He didn't pay any money to have a mask set for her. He simply buried her. And when it was found out, uh, he was hauled up before the judge 
uh, for the charge of contempt okay. of religion. Yeah, and so he was questioned by the judge. He said, uh, did you not say a mass uh, for your wife? Uh, get, a, get a mass said for your wife? He said, no, I simply uh, uh, buried her in a hole in the ground and committed her soul to, to God. And the judge said, but do you not know that if you not say a mass, have a mass said for your wife, uh, her soul would be in peril? And the man said, uh, no, that, uh, that isn't necessary. Uh, she went straight to heaven. The judge said, how do you know that? And he pulled the indulgence out of his pocket and said, here, this is the indulgence my wife purchased. And they looked it over and they said, uh, yes. Uh, and they acquitted him uh, of, uh, of all charges. And uh, there, was another, there was another incident. Uh, there was this, uh, this knight who came up to Tetzel and, uh, and said, can I buy an indulgence for a sin that I intend to commit? And, and Tetzel was like, eh, okay. Okay, so he bought, uh, he bought an indulgence for a sin he was about to commit. And uh, Tetzel was uh, leaving the town, uh, going off to sell indulgences in another place. And then that night, with, uh, with some friends, came, ambushed him, uh, beat him with some sticks, and took away the coffer, that, that box of all his, uh, all his earnings from the sale of uh, indulgences. And when Tetzel cried a robbery and tried to sue him before the judge, uh, that knight took out the indulgence that Tetzel had sold him and said that uh, I am uh, absolved uh, of this, uh, of any punishment uh, for this sin. And uh, he, was, he was let go. <laughs> yes, uh, people did see through how, uh, how, ridiculous, uh, how ridiculous this all was. Uh, in fact, one... Uh, one poor miner, right? I uh, said to said to Tetzo, right? If the if the Pope can indeed remit all these sins, right, for for the for our for the pennies in our pocket, right? Then he is the most uh, he's the most cruel man on earth, right? He's so rich. Why wouldn't he just uh, do it for do it for all of us? Yeah. Right. So the reactions to indulgences. Still, many common people uh, bought them, uh, believed in them, and, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of money went to the papacy uh, because of that. But there were many who were also uh, disturbed, uh, disturbed by this. And in particular, the German princes saw, saw this as, as the papacy draining money from, uh, from German people and from German lands. And obviously, they weren't, uh, they weren't very happy uh, about it. Okay, Luther. Yeah, now the 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 governor, uh, yeah, rather the the elector, uh, Frederick, who was the ruler over uh over Saxony, right, where uh Luther uh was, right, was a uh, he he disallowed uh, Tetzel from selling indulgences in his uh, territory. But Tetzel came near anyway, and some of uh, Luther's uh, parishioners uh, went to buy those uh, indulgences. And, uh, and Luther was a, was a confessor, and so some, some people came and... Uh, and uh, or rather, Luther was a priest, and they would come to him for absolution, right? And, and Luther, Luther demanded of them uh, repentance and, and of amending, amending their ways. And, and these people said, oh, no, no, we don't have to amend our ways, right? Uh, we have these indulgences. And they showed him these indulgences. And, and when Luther read it, he was absolutely mortified. And he told them that these pieces of paper are absolutely worthless. Now, obviously, Luther was uh, Luther was very, very concerned about about this thing, about this uh, selling of forgiveness of sins like that, and and on thirty first October fifteen seventeen, Martin Luther nails ninety five theses. Right, theses is the plural of uh thesis, which is uh which is a statement, right, 
it is a it's a statement that is to be uh that is to be proven or debated, right? So he wrote ninety five of these statements, and he nailed it on the door of the church in Wittenberg. Now the door of the church is sort of like, uh. A notice board for the town and Luther wrote it in Latin which only the educated scholars could read and it was more meant as an invitation for, uh, for scholars and theologians to come and debate in the university about, uh, about these things and the content of these theses was theses were about questioning the, the efficacy of uh, indulgences among other things, right? And, and this is this event has been seen as uh, marking the start of uh, the Protestant uh, Reformation. I'll show you some of the these theses. Okay. Uh, the very first one, right? When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says repent, he means that the whole life of his followers on earth is a constant and continual repentance. Second, this expression cannot be understood of the sacrament of penitence right, as administered by the priest. Third thesis, still the Lord intends not to speak merely of internal repentance. Internal repentance is now if it does not manifest itself externally by the mortification of the flesh. Thesis uh, six, the Pope cannot remit any condemnation but only declare and confirm the remission which God himself has given. And so here is a, it's an attack on the authority of the Pope to remit sins. This is 32. Those who imagine they are sure of salvation by means of indulgences will go to the devil with those who teach them so. 35. It is anti-Christian doctrine to pretend that in order to deliver a soul from purgatory or to purchase an indulgence, there is no need of either sorrow or repentance. 36. Every Christian who truly repents of his sins has entire forgiveness of the penalty and the fault, and so far has no need of indulgence. Okay, this, is, this one here is quite uh, interesting, uh, quite telling. Uh, 50. Christians must be told that if the Pope knew of the extortions of the preachers of indulgences, he would rather that the metropolis of St. Peter were burned and reduced to ashes than see it built with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. Right here, Luther is thinking that the Pope actually does not know of, uh, of the abuse that is going on and that the Pope would not, uh, would not do such a thing of, uh, of building the, building the St. Peter's Basilica with the with the last pennies of poor peasants. 51. Christians must be told that the Pope, as is his duty, would dispense his own money to the poor people whom the preachers of indulgences are now robbing of their last penny. Were he for that purpose even to sell the metropolis of St. Peter? 52. To hope to be saved by indulgences is an enemy and lying it's an empty and lying hope, even should the commissary of indulgences, nay, the Pope himself, be pleased to pledge his own soul in security of it. Okay, uh, finally, for the last thesis that I'll quote, Why, say they, does not the Pope, whose wealth is greater than that of rich Croesus, build the metropolis of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with that of poor Christians? Now, instead of uh, having people come and debate him, his theses are translated into German, the language of the common people, and copied and spread rapidly. Within two weeks, it had reached all of Germany. So what happens uh, after that? So here in the background is a picture of uh, Martin Luther and the Diet of uh, Worms which I wanted to talk about today, but I think I have too much material, so I will do it in the next session. After the 95 pieces, it reactions. Many were glad to see it. Like I said, the, many people saw through, uh, saw quite clearly that this whole, 
this whole thing of indulgences was a was a scam, huh? was abuse, was spiritual abuse, and in a sense, they were just waiting for, for someone to say it. And Martin Luther was sort of the proverbial child who pointed out that the emperor had no clothes uh, on. And, and many people lend their support to, to, this, uh, to this criticism of indulgences for one reason or another. But some were concerned that Luther was stirring up too much trouble. He was going to make a lot of trouble uh, for himself and that he should, uh, he should lay low and, and that uh, he should not have uh, done that. And well, they were right in that there would be a lot of trouble that would, uh, that would come from this. And Tetzel and those who profited from the sales of indulgences were livid, obviously, right? And uh, Tetzel actually debated with Luther at one early point and he was soundly, uh, soundly beaten by uh, Luther. And when it came to Leo, the Pope in Rome, the, 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 the 95 Theses uh, took about one month to reach Rome. Uh, Leo X initially dismissed the seriousness of the situation. He was like, ah, this German monk probably drank too much wine one day and this. Yeah, he'll be uh he'll be over it. Lah. Yeah, this is just a storm in a teacup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's uh, nothing much. Uh. Yeah, also a squabble between uh, Dominicans and Augustinians because uh, this Tetzo, this Tetzo fellow was uh, was from the uh, Dominican order, a different uh, monastic order. Yeah. So uh, Leo the Tenth, I uh, didn't initially see how uh, how serious the attack was. And uh, Erasmus of, uh, of Rotterdam, which uh, I have uh, I've talked about in a previous lesson, a very important uh, Renaissance humanist uh, scholar who, who also wanted, uh, was pushing for moral reform in, uh, in the Roman church. He said, I am not at all astonished at his, meaning Luther, having made so much noise, for he has committed two unpardonable faults. He has attacked the tiara of the Pope and the belly of the monks. Okay. Now the greed of the monks from the sale of the indulgences, uh, yes, that was that. But the tiara of the Pope, the authority of the Pope, right? Luther would take a bit more time to come to finally uh, reject uh, the authority of, uh, of the Pope. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, two two uh, debates that Luther took part in. He actually took part in quite a few uh, debates after that with various uh, representatives from the papal uh, hierarchy. Uh, but we'll talk about two of them. Uh, the first is the Heidelberg uh, disputation. Luther is, uh, is summoned to appear before the governing body of uh, his, monas his order, the Augustinian order. And uh, he met them in April 1518 in the city of uh, Heidelberg. And Luther there presented 40 theses uh, defending Augustinian doctrines. Augustinian referring to uh, from uh, Augustine of Hippo. Augustinian doctrines of, uh, of sin and grace. Now, if you are not aware of what uh, these doctrines are, they basically uh, emphasize uh, human inability in the, in the face of uh, our fallen nature, our corruption, and our absolute need for the grace of God. Okay? So these are the doctrines that uh, Augustine uh, expounded and Luther presented uh, these theses. And at the Heidelberg Disputation was where he won over a, uh, a, few, a few people. One of them is Martin Bucer, who would be a very important uh, character uh, later on. Some of these theses, the law of God is a salutary rule of life. Nevertheless, it cannot aid men in his search after righteousness. On the contrary, it impedes him. Works of men, how fair and good soever they may be, are to all appearance only mortal sins. Works of God, how deformed and bad soever they may appear, have always an immortal 
merit. Since the fall of man, free will exists only in name, and when man does all that is possible for him to do, he sins mortally. A man who expects to attain to grace by doing all that it is possible for him to do adds sin to sin and doubles his guilt. It is certain that men, to become capable of receiving the grace of Christ, must entirely despair of himself. Uh, the second uh, debate, the Leipzig uh, disputation. So, uh, Johann Eck, uh, one of the uh, one of the cardinals of uh, of the the Roman Roman Church, right, challenged uh, Kalstedt, which is Luther's superior in Wittenberg University, to debate. Now, the the lecturers uh, at Wittenberg University had already begun uh, teaching uh, what Luther what Luther thought of uh, on, on sin and, and grace. And Luther and his friend Melanchthon, uh, Melanchthon will be a character we will meet uh, later on in our series. They accompanied Kalstedt to the Leipzig uh, disputation in uh, 1519. And Kalstedt was beaten by Eck, but, but Luther stepped in and he debated with Eck and he expanded the terms of the debate, the subject of the debate onto the authority of, uh, of the Pope. And this is where he, uh, he challenged the authority of the Pope and maintained that uh, the scripture is the only infallible authority, not popes, not councils. And an act uh, forced Luther to align himself with John Huss. John Huss, the, uh, the proto-reformer who who actually did teach uh, this doctrine that, uh, that the Pope, right, Popes and Councils are not infallible, only scripture is uh, infallible. And he was burned at a stake in Constance in 1415 for that. And he is counted as the church, by the church as a heretic. And Luther uh, was forced to admit that he was aligned uh, with Huss, the heretic. Now, after the Leipzig uh, disputation, Leo X now realizes that Luther is to be taken uh, seriously. And later on, Luther is convinced that the Pope, uh, the Pope is uh, the Antichrist uh, himself. Right? And he has, uh, in fact, he even declares uh, himself uh, a Hussite. Right? Uh, following uh, the, the teaching of, uh, of John Hust. And Pope Leo uh, X issues the papal bull, which is a, a decree from the papacy, right? Exergi Domine, which is translated, Arise, O Lord. So these papal bulls were named after the, the first words of the, the papal bull. And, and what the bull says at the start is basically, Arise, O Lord for a ball has entered your vineyard, right? So Leo X has, uh, Leo X compared uh, Martin Luther to a wild boar, uh, a raging, uh, raging, roving wild boar, destroying, uh, destroying all the, the vines of God's uh, vineyard. Luther is ordered to recant and uh, renounce his errors within 60 days or be burnt as a heretic, right? But Luther, where he was uh, in Northern Germany, right, he had uh, immense popular uh, support. And, and wherever copies of the papal bull uh, were, dis were distributed, the people took them and, uh, and burned them, right? And also burned works of scholastic uh, theology, which is the theology of uh, the Roman uh, Catholic Church. And, and Luther, did uh, publicly burn one such copy of, uh, of the papal bull. So Luther is excommunicated, but the Roman church uh, cannot touch him for, uh, by reason of uh, his popular support. Before we end off, I'll, have a, I'll do a brief uh, excursus on, the, on justification and, uh, and the Reformation. Now, some, uh, some may have the idea that the Reformation was, uh, was all about the doctrine of uh, justification by grace alone 
through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is uh, actually a mistaken uh, notion. But of course, it is a very central part of the Reformation. But that is not all there is uh, to the Reformation. And in fact, Luther did not arrive at a full opt uh, doctrine until 1519, which as you, as you recall, is, will be after he nailed the 95 Theses in 1517. And it took time for the doctrine of justification to become, uh, to become central in, uh, in the Reformation. And note also that Luther was not excommunicated for his doctrine uh, of justification. And uh, well, he was excommunicated for his, uh, for his denying the infallibility and authority of, uh, of the Pope. And the Reformation was also equally a Reformation of, uh, of worship and of, uh, and of church government. Okay? Now, this, uh, this uh, Reformation of worship is something that uh, Calvin actually explains in his letter to, to Sedoletto. Like, what is the Reformation all about? Recovering the proper uh, worship of God. Right? And and if you see, if you note later, later history, um, you, it's kind of interesting that uh, it is not so much the doctrine, doctrine of salvation, but uh, the doctrine, the Roman doctrine of transubstantiation that determines whether you are in, uh, whether you are Roman Catholic uh, or, or Protestant. Uh, later on in the 17th century, there's a group, uh, there's a group known as the Jansenists, uh, who were essentially Calvinistic in their understanding of grace and, uh, and salvation. But they remained firmly within the fold of, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church because they held unswervingly to the doctrine of transubstantiation. Okay, so uh, I've come to the end uh, of this lesson. So what we have uh, managed to cover today, Martin Luther's early life and education, uh, abandoning his legal studies, joining the Augustinian order, is tormented by uh, a guilty conscience. Uh, he studies uh, the Bible and, uh, and Augustine, and uh, he has uh, John Stalpitz who, who guides him into the doctrine of, uh, of justification by, uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Indulgences and the 95 Theses. So uh, we've seen uh, the, the sale of indulgences, the abuse. Luther is horrified at this, his concern. He nails... Uh, the 95 Theses, and, and then it uh, explodes, it goes viral, and there are all these uh, there are reactions uh, to these uh, theses. Some say some were very glad to, to see it, and well, others were enraged, and there were the debates as, uh, as Luther also further developed uh, his thought and belief uh, after the 95 Theses, also. And finally, he is excommunicated in, uh, in 1520. Right, so that is uh that is all I have uh for today.